All right, everybody, if we could find our places very quickly. Amen. Tonight I'm going to speak about a subject that I have not ever spoken about. And it um, took a while to put together, obviously, but uh, it's called The Ten Habits of Highly Effective uh, Healthy Homes, is what it's called. There is a... Um, A run on Christian families today. If you don't think I'm telling the truth, just look at the opening day of the Summer Olympics in Paris. If you didn't get upset about that, then there's something wrong with your Holy Ghost. That's just how I feel about it. And if you haven't seen it, it was a bunch of drag queens posing for the Lord's Supper. And the one in the middle was actually a Jewish man posing as Christ. And so we come here and sometimes we are sheltered in a lot of ways. And if we're not careful, we're like ostriches with our head in the sand and we think that everything's okay. When in reality, it's not. There's a wicked world out there. And if you're going to have a safe environment in church it's because you work at it if you're going to have a safe environment in your home it's because you're not going to let certain things come into your home well thank you for three people who believe that it's true I stand at the door of my home as the watchman on the wall and sometimes as the watchman on the wall of not only my home, but also of the church, it's not a very popular position. But I'm not in this thing for popularity. I'm into this thing to get everybody I can to heaven. And sometimes the things that we have to say are not always popular. There was a prophet in the Word of God, and that prophet... Um, he prophesied things that were not pleasing to individuals. And as he prophesied, one other prophet walked up to him, read it, it's there, and slapped him in the face. And said, you always prophesy doom and gloom and all this other kind of stuff. But the problem that we live with today is that you have individuals that are wanting to not be God's man or watchman on the wall and you're wanting to be the people's man or woman, whichever it may be. God didn't call us to do that. You can only line up to what is in the Word of God. The Word of God does not line up to me. The, I line up to the Word of God. Because at the end, when this is all said and done, we will be judged by the Bible. And so, I'm going to start teaching a series tonight on the 10 habits of highly healthy homes. And I think... It starts in the home. It does not start in the church. I can preach it or someone else can stand behind this pulpit and preach it. But if it's not practiced in the home, everything we do is null and void. Can I get an amen? amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 20. And when you, while you do that, I just want to say that it's good to have Brother Carl Britt with us tonight. God bless you. Good to see you. Amen. Good to have... Uh, sister Rochelle here as well, his sister, and uh, that is also the siblings of Sister Carlina, and uh, so we're glad that they're here, and uh, always good to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to read something to you that's very familiar in your hearing, and here it is. Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3. I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Here it is, starting with verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There are people that think that the Ten Commandments are null and void to us as Christians today. That is not true. Can you prove that, Pastor? Sure I can. Go down here and knock off the 7-Eleven and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you're going to have... Some brothers in blue with lights going on, picking you up before the end of the night. Just because it's in the Old Testament does not mean it doesn't have any effect on us today. Right. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Ten Commandments and I'm going to parallel them to us today and how to have highly effective homes. The order of the Ten Commandments is not haphazard. I believe that God put them in the Word of God, in the Pentateuch, the way that they are for a purpose. Because this commandment right here, here's habit number one. This is the foundation for having a strong, healthy home. It is the very first commandment and the most important commandment of all the commandments. Why? Because it tells us to examine our priorities. What is a principle? What is a principle? I'm not talking about the head honcho of a school, okay? What is a principle? You have principles in your life. What's a principle? Like a what? Like a moral, okay. A foundation of behavior, okay, good. Someone sit over here. A standard, yeah. Do principles change? They should? They shouldn't, okay. I'm going to say, we need to talk then. <laughs> uh, you're right, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. There are things in my life that are principles, and I don't violate them. There are things that are principles because I see them clearly in the Word of God, and I will not violate what's in the Bible. There are people that um, they vacillate with who's ever in their company at that point. And the Apostle Paul had a problem with an individual like that by the name of Peter. He said, when you get around Judaizers, you hold, uphold the law. But when you get around Christians, you do away with the law and you uphold grace. And the Apostle Paul said in the book of Galatians, he said, the Bible says, he use this word, he withstood him to the face. In other words, he got nose to nose with him and rebuked him. Why? Because you can't have one hand over here and one hand over here. It does not work that way. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If it's a principle, it's a principle. And no matter who's there, I don't change it. I can't change it. I don't have the right to change it. Every time God gives a principle, but he also gives a promise. Proverbs 3 and 6 says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Do you want to be successful in life? You want to be successful? You want to be successful? What do you need to do? Examine your priorities. Hmm. Boy, it gets real quiet when pastor starts teaching now. Because we get close to home at that point. Yeah. Examine your priorities. Is God number one in your life? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The North American divorce rate right now is one in three. Now listen. It's one in three marriages. However... Harvard University did a study, and this is what they found out. Marriage is where the wedding is in a church. The divorce rate is 1 in 50. Right now, across the board, divorce rate is 1 in 3. But if a person gets married in the church, it drops to 1 in 50. Now, I'm just going to say something. I've married people all over the place. I've married them in my office. I've married them in the church. I've married them in garden settings. I've married them, you name it. Probably the only place I haven't married them is in a funeral home. But I've married a lot of people over the course of almost 40 years of ministry. And the sad thing is, is a lot of those weddings, a lot of those marriages don't stay together. Why? Because their priorities are not right. When God instituted marriage, watch now, he made Adam, he made Eve, and God was up here. The closer Adam and Eve get to God, the closer they get together. But when you take God out of that equation, what you have is you have two men and women going parallel to one another. God's, if God's not in the equation of that marriage, 
then it's not going to stay together. Why? Because God is the author of marriage. He's the one who instituted marriage in the book of Genesis. And so when our priorities are messed up, we don't get closer to God. We get further away from God. Marriages, when they are, uh, in marriages where they are married in a Christian ceremony, they go to church every week, they read the Bible, they pray together. Here's what happens in the divorce rate. Now, remember, if they go to just get married in a church, the divorce rate drops from one in three to one in 50. If they go to church together, they read the Bible together, they worship God together, they pray together, they're a Christian home, that divorce rate drops to one and 1,105. That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me. When I'm counseling with young couples, this is what I look at them and I say, are you gonna get married in the church? My children, they're not perfect because their dad's not perfect and they're from me. But we got married in the church. When Aaron and Shannon got married 12 years ago, they got married in the church. The first marriage that I performed in this church was Jonathan and Michaela's in August. Four years ago? Be four years ago, next month. First wedding was their wedding. But I've had individuals, I don't want to get married in the church. Is this about marriage? No, it's about priorities right now. I want to get married. Some, they want to get away from everything that they grew up learning. Hello? What are you saying, Pastor? Put God first. Put God first. That's what I'm saying. That's what is being said in the book of Exodus chapter Number 20 and verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Put God first. How do I put God first then? I'm glad you asked that question. Because I'm going to take the word first and I'm going to use it as an acronym. F-I-R-S-T. How do you put God first? Number one, here's the F. Put God first in your finances. Now you can ask my wife, now or after church, but this is the first time I have ever spoken behind a pulpit about finances to a church. I am not the kind of preacher that gets up and slams people giving. Because most of the time when people walk in the church, they just think that the preacher wants in their pocketbook in the first place. But I'm not talking to individuals who don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to home folk right now. And I'm talking about examining our priorities. How many want to be blessed of God? Come on, you want to be blessed of God? Here we go. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with thy first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst forth with new wine. God says, give me the first and I'll bless the rest. Give me the first and I'll bless the rest. The Bible teaches that money is the number one test of our priorities. Your checkbook reveals what's really important to you. Not what you say, but how you spend your money. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's true. I'm going to talk about some things here in just a moment. But I'm talking about our priorities. There was a lady that came here on... Wednesday night, a week ago today, she came. A single woman, Sister Beth Long, she's going to two countries that are probably, number one, against women. And with what she's going to be saying and preaching and teaching, they don't want anything to do with it. She's going to Iraq and Iran. She's a single missionary woman going to those countries we had to actually turn the, the camera off and could not even film because it's one of those type of countries that we, they cannot see her. What I appreciated about Sister Beth Long is that most individuals come in, speak about the country for about 10 minutes and they preach the rest of the time and they leave. Sister Long did not do that. Sister Long got up and she talked about her, the country and the burden that she had for 
I think it was about an hour. And then she sat in the restaurant with us afterwards and apologized. I said, I'm so sorry. She could have went on longer. And there were some of you, Brother David and I were talking today, there's some of you that sat there and listened to everything she had, and you were like taking it all in. I was sitting right here. Now, God has called her to go. Not all of us can go. But God has called us to be able to give. And a giving church is a revival church. A giving family is a blessed family. And so if you want to be blessed of God and you want your children to be blessed of God, teach them how to give. I'll wait on you. It's okay. I'm, silence doesn't bother me. I'm a pastor. I'm used to it. Hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. Some of you just caught on. God's word talks more about giving than heaven or hell. Over half of Jesus' parables deals with the subject of money. There are more promises in the Bible about giving than any other subject. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verse 23. Thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place where he has, chooses to place his name there. The tithe of the corn, of thy wine, thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. That's the book of Deuteronomy. What is tithing? What is tithing? That's not just a question I'm throwing out there. It's one I want us to look at. What is tithing? Okay, but that's true, but that's not answering what it is. What is tithing? Someone said it over here? What's that? Okay. Tithing is a, it means a tenth is what it means. A lot of people look and say, I can't do that. Okay, I understand what you're saying. But I'm asking you, do you want to be blessed? I'm going to tell you how Sister Bishop and I do it. I'm not walking in telling you how to do your finances. But if you need me to help you, I can help you. Amen. If you need me to help you to be blessed, I can show you how to be blessed. Amen. When I get a paycheck and she gets a paycheck, nothing comes out of that paycheck. Nothing comes out of that paycheck until my tithe is taken care of. Until my tithe is taken care of. That's exactly right. You're actually taking the words right out of my mouth. That's my next point. <laughs> but you're fine, my brother. I'm glad you're thinking because that's what it is. The Bible calls it your first fruits. First fruits. It's what it is. You don't wait until you pay everything off and then give God what's left. No, no, no. God didn't do that. And God doesn't do that. And God doesn't expect that from us. What God expects from me is before I pay the PG&E bill, I put gas in my car, I pay the insurance, I pay whatever. God expects me to take care. Does God need my 10? Nope. Bible says he owns all the cattle on the, on the thousand hills and all the gold and the silver underneath those hills. He doesn't need that. What he, what he needs is my obedience. Because what I am doing is I'm telling God, I trust you. You have a question? Sure. Then you give your life. Yeah, there you go. That's exactly what, you have 24 hours in a day? Okay, how much, how much tithe of that belongs to God? Two, hour, two, hour, two, uh, two hours and 40 minutes. If you have no money to give to God, you have two hours and 40 minutes to give to God a day. You can, absolutely. But if you have no money at all, we always have something in which to give to God. She was a little woman. She had nothing to give to God except a widow's mite. Now, my son-in-laws and I, we, we were able to sit down with, with Brother um, Exum from American Canyon. And he's an archaeologist. And he sat down there with us and he said, I want to show you what a widow's mite looked like. And he had all the coins of the New Testament out there. They were not replicas. These were originals. And he showed me what a widow's mite was. It was smaller than my little fingernail. 
and it didn't, it, it didn't, wasn't hardly worth anything. But the Bible says that when that little woman put that widow's mite in there, she gave more than anybody else gave. Because it's not about the amount that you give. It's how you give it. It's how you give it. We used to have a thing, and some of you, we've worshiped together before, you'll understand. We called a building fund sharing a miracle. Let me remember that, okay? That's what started, and what, that's what put uh, the church out on Highway 99. It's called sharing a miracle. But here's what it went on to say. Not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. Because what one person can give in $5,000, another person, $5 is the extreme for them. So it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. Now let's just talk about this for a moment. Pastor, nobody, nobody told me to say this. This is not even in my notes, it's just coming in my head and I'm going to say it. Do I tithe on gifts that have been given to me? No. Do I tithe on my income tax? Yes. Am I honest on my income tax? Yes. I usually have to pay in on my income tax. I'm not like my kids. My kids tell me, oh man, we got this amount of money back. I'm going, okay, you're buying dinner tonight. And we got that money. Okay, you're, you're taking care of my hotel. No. I have it set up simply because I don't want Uncle Sam using my money because they're really not getting anything back it's just what they overpaid that's all they're getting back it's what they overpaid so they overpay and this is what Uncle Sam gives them back I don't overpay but the campus I'm not overpaying Uncle Sam so guess what you're not using my money I'm using yours and I have a little while to pay your money back Hello? But I don't do that with God. I was gone. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to be very, very honest. Just kind of lay it out there. I get paid on the 1st and the 15th. We were gone on the 15th. We had money in the bank. We didn't pay the bills. Why? Because God didn't get his first at that point. Hello? And so I came home, and Sister Bishop, we have a binder. She opened up the binder. She starts right away. Lodi Christian life and our tithe, and then everything else. And that's how we do it. And our life has always been blessed. If you find out that you're short, running short of money, maybe you need to go back and see if we robbed God. Because we've got money for everything else. But we can't take care of God? Now listen. You not giving of your tithe is not going to make me go hungry. I promise you that. But it will make you go hungry. Because that's not on me. That's on the individual. Can I get an amen? amen. And some of you might be saying, well, I can't afford to pay tithes. You can't afford not to pay tithes. You can't afford not to pay tithes. Now, I'm going to give you something right here. First of all, where should, I, um, where should I tithe? You should tithe where you are spiritually fed, right here at the local church. Not somebody else's church. Not some TV preacher that you see on, on the internet. or it's not, not, not Lakewood down in Houston, Texas. You pay to your local church. That's where you give your tithe. Second thing is this. The matter of tithing is the only instance where God says, test me and see if I exist. I'm going to prove it in just a moment. In other words, let me bless you and prove myself to you. Book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse that, ye may, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and there should not be room enough to receive it. I just kind of let that sink in and let that marinate in your brain for just a moment. 
Because like I said, you can ask my wife in almost 40 years of ministry, I have never one time ever stood behind a pulpit and ever looked at people and said, you need to tithe. Are we doing well? Yes. Financially? Yes. But my question to you is, what are your priorities? Do you want your family blessed? Do you want your children blessed? Do you want good health for your kids? Then do what God is asking us to do. The I of first is this. Our interest. The F was finances. The second is our interest. 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. Apostle Paul says, whether you, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. If God is going to be number one, you put him first in your interest. What are your amusements? Here we go. What's your recreation? What are your hobbies? Everything you do with an attitude of gratitude puts God first in that area. Enjoy the things God has given you. The older that I get, you want to know what I enjoy? I enjoy my grandkids running up to me and throwing their arms around my leg. With Carl Britton saying, Poppy, I missed you. I missed you, Poppy. Tomorrow night, we have our family night. We've been doing it for years. We have family dinner together. That's what we do on Thursday night. I told the college this a long time ago when I was a, a professor at the college. Unless your hair is on fire, do not call me or do not knock on my door. I said, because I will not answer it. Why? Because that is important to me. That's important to my children. I'm just going to say this. I've seen a lot of preachers do this. You ain't going to get that out of this preacher. And that is they put their families on the back burner. And they wonder why their families are lost. It's because they put the family of God over their own family. Or daddy was out preaching somewhere else. And because he wanted to be known here or there somewhere else in a conference. And mm -mm, my family is too, is too important to me to do that. And you know and I know that Pastor Bishop doesn't hardly go anywhere. I stay right home. Why? Because I think that if you're going to win a city and God's called you to pastor, then you need to go stay home and smell like sheep. Let that sink in for just a moment. Sheep have a certain smell to them. They don't smell like a horse. I was raised on a farm. They thank God they don't smell like the pig pen. Though some of them get in it every now and then, proverbially. Um, but they have a certain odor about them. And they are dependent upon the shepherd. It's true. I think I have traveled. June, I did a wedding. July, I, we, we had revival. Then we went to Howe, and then I went to Baltimore. And it's like, man, I don't even like going that much. Thank God he didn't call me to be an evangelist. Because I don't like going like that. But I get excited about my town, my city. I love Lodi, California. And wherever you, you live, Brother Carl Britt, you live in Southern California. You love your city because that's where God called you to. When I dropped these ladies off from, from, from having lunch with them today, my wife and, and Sister Bracken, I drove right over here to Highway 99. And I looked at about five acres that were over there. And I stopped and I just, how can I, I'm like this, how can I put a church right there? That's how I am. Why? Because I love my community. If you talk to an individual... You'll know what their interest is within about five minutes because it starts coming out of them. If I'm standing there and somebody introduces me to someone else, pretty soon I'm going to tell you what's going to come up. God. Lodi Christian Life. You. Sister Cedar, I've told the world about you. Everybody knows about you because in a certain message that I preach, you're in that message. And I told him about the time that you just sat right here and you got so stinking discouraged because you hadn't gotten the Holy Ghost and you did. And I tell the whole story. 
and everybody knows about you. Brother Jeremy, there's a lot of people that know about you from pastor's mouth because I know what God's done in your life. And I tell people about what God's done in your life. So don't think that you're not important. You're important to the kingdom of God. Sister Yolanda, you're important to the kingdom of God. I tell people that when I baptized you, all of a sudden you could see as almost as if you, it was coming right inside of you. When you got the baptism, everybody that was around that baptistry up there could see it. These are the things that I talk about. These are the things that I speak about. I tell people about you all the time, both of you. But here's what I tell them, Brother Osuna. I said, there's times I stand over by that door in Spanish and people don't even know that I'm here. And at a certain song, Brother Osuna will go, ayy! And it's right on beat. It's right on almost every time. Am I telling the truth? When I see certain individuals and they're worshiping God, it just does something for me. It does something to me. But Gene, I tell everybody how I met you. Not a long time ago when we worked bus ministry together. Three years ago. When you were coming down Walmart in that cart. And I looked down at you and you're driving that cart. And I said, hi Gino. And you looked up at me. And you got very emotional. And you reached your hand up to me. And you said, Brother Bishop, is that really you? And I knelt down beside you and I said, yeah, Gino, it's me. And then you walked into church that Sunday morning. But Sergio, I tell everybody about you and your testimony. And how you were going to bolt after David had called me. And I was going to pick you up and I knew that you weren't going to be there. And you came out of your, 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 your trailer and just looked at me and just put your head down and smiled and got in my truck and we came to church. Because I was supposed to be there at 9.30 and I got there at 9 o'clock. And when I tell people stories like this, all of a sudden it's like, ah, I can see what his interest is. When I see people get the Holy Ghost like Theron, they got the Holy Ghost standing right here on Sunday morning. I was just making a point of an illustration of what had taken place in Baltimore. And he took it as if I was asking him right then and there on the spot if he was wanted the Holy Ghost. And the first thing he does is throw his hand in the air. I said, you're gonna get the Holy Ghost this morning. And sure enough, he came right up here, threw his hands in the air. Brother Fagler was on this side. Brother Angel soon was on that side. Tears rolled down his face. And within five minutes, Theron was, was, was speaking in other tongues. And he's going to men's retreat. What is it that excites you? I can't answer that question. You can tell a person's priorities by seeing what they get excited about. That's what becomes important to us. A good test is what most people talk about. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Speak to yourself in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs. Oh man, pastor does this all the time. People think that I've lost my mind going down the road because I'm talking, they think I'm talking to myself. Sometimes I'm singing, sometimes I'm praying, sometimes I am talking to myself. Sometimes I'm repenting. Come on. Amen. Preachers need to repent too. Because you think that they don't get attitudes and deal with saints, you're wrong. <laughs> they need to repent. At least this one does. And I'm being honest. I think every person that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost needs to repent every now and then. And son, like I've said it on many, many occasions, some of my best prayer meetings do not happen in the church. They happen going down the road. The R of first is relationships. Now, I'm going to park on this one right here for just a moment. Proverbs 27 and 19. As water, as in, as in water face answereth to, 
face answers to face, so the heart of man to man. As in water, face to face answers to face, so the heart of man. So the heart of man to man. What's it saying? As a man reflects his face in the water, so the heart reflects the real person. That's what that scripture's talking about. When we look into the water, it reflects who we are. And what the wise man is saying is as we look in that, so the heart reflects the real me. Everyone sees who we are. They see what we've got on. They know that we're dressed right. They, come on, here we go. But what is the real you? The real you is what you are when nobody is watching. That's the real you. What are you at home? What are you when nobody's looking? What are you when pastor's not watching? What are you when my mom and dad's not looking? What are you when the wife or the husband's not looking? That's who the real you is. If you want God first in your life, you're going to have to choose your friends carefully. I'm going to say that again. If you want God in your life, you have to choose your friends carefully. I have a lot of acquaintances, but I don't have a lot of friends. I have a few, have a lot of acquaintances, but I don't have a lot of friends. Because they don't want to live the life that I choose to live. I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else, because I'm not. I'm not saying what they're doing is wrong and what I'm doing is right. This is my standard. And Brother Angel, as my, this being my standard, I'm not moving away from it. Now the standard may not be everybody else's standard, but it's pastor's standard. And I don't move away from it. What are you talking about, Brother Bishop? Give you an example. God delivered me out of the rodeo. I made thousands of dollars in the rodeo. Thousands. Four years, a quarter of a million dollars. It's a lot of money. I grew up poor. You all know the story. I grew up abused. You all know the story. But when you find something that you're good at and you're always looking for the affirmation of people because you've never had that in your entire life and you find something that you're good at and all of a sudden people are uh, chanting your name among five to 15,000 people in the middle of an arena and on an average you're making $5,000 in a weekend that's not bad money. And you're getting the affirmation that you want that you never had in your life. Hello? And all of a sudden, God comes into my life because I'm a backslidden young person and I pray through in Yuba City, California, Brother Morgan Underwood's church and I never turn around and look back again. I was an alcoholic. I never went to Al-Anon, never went to Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to a Pentecostal altar and a little old preacher got on one side, his wife got on the other side and prayed me back through the Holy Ghost and I was done with that life. Never went back again. I married the superb young person out of Christian Life Center. It was like Beauty and the Beast. What are y'all laughing about? I didn't say who was Beauty and who was the Beast. <laughs> how it happened was unique but it happened and 40 years later where a lot of those marriages are about to follow fell apart mine's not we still get up in the morning go to the house of God come to prayer we still enjoy having dinner together and being each other's company but there's one thing I don't do. I don't go back to the rodeo again. I just don't. Is it okay for you to? If you want. I don't have a problem with it. I don't. Because when I go, I know what happens. I will sit there and my legs begin to move. And I said, never again. Never again. Why? Because I know what it takes to be number one. I know what it means to win. And out of 310 cowboys in the state of California, I was seventh when I was 16. So when I went walking to a place and 
probably about 10 years ago. And uh, this individual comes running up to me and says, I know you. How do you know me? I know you. Well, who, who am I? Well, you're Richard Bishop. You used to be the bull rider. And I went, in my mind, I'm going, sweet Moses. And I looked at him and I said, buddy, that was a long, long time ago. He said, yeah, but I was there when you won, Salinas. I was watching you. And I looked at him straight and I said, buddy, I don't do that anymore. So let me tell you what I do now. I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. And I started telling him about Jesus right there on the spot. To some people, it's not near as exciting. But I will tell you this, the rewards are out of this world. The rewards of serving Jesus are out of this world. I may not make the near as much money as I did when I was a kid, but I can tell you this right now, when I lay my head down on my pillow at night, I have peace in my heart and I don't have to lay down and, and wonder if I, Lord, if you come tonight, I'm not going to heaven, I'm going to hell. So please don't come tonight, God. And now I lay my head down on my pillow and said, come on, Jesus. This is a rough world right now. Come on, it's not going to hurt my feelings if you want to sound the trumpet right now. Amen. Think about it. What are your interests? If God is first in your family, you're going to have to choose your friends carefully. Why? Because you become like the people that you spend the most time with. If you spend time with people who take God lightly, you will be a casual believer something that I say and it is simply this if you live for God hard it's easy but if you live for God easy it's hard I believe that I live my life that way I live for God hard there's a book several years ago by a guy by the name of Tommy Tenney and it was called a God chaser I read a few things in the book and that was it but I like the title I do I like the title a God chaser. That's, you got the book? That's what I want to be known as. I want to be known as the person who runs after God. Because if I run after God, God will tell me things that he doesn't tell everybody else. Now, some people, this is what they do. They're okay with a large facility and a lot of people, but they're not God chasers. They're not. And just that because you have a big building and a lot of people doesn't mean you've got a church. You got a big building and a lot of people. That's all you got. But if you want to look at me and ask me who my heroes are, I'll, I will tell you. They're not preachers for the most part. I'll tell you who those people that were my heroes are. They were the saints of old that sat in the pew that never got behind a pulpit, but they were faithful to God and they were in the house of God every Sunday, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday. Yeah. I sat, I was talking to an individual at Howe the other day. His name is um, Kevin uh, Payne. And when Kevin Payne and Laura Payne got married, I picked them up at the airport. And I talked to them all the way back because one of my jobs for new individuals, new hires at Christian Life Center back in the day was they had to know where everybody was. And people are creatures of habit. How do I know? Here we go. Every time you come, you sit in the same place when you come, right in this area. That's where you sit. This is your seat. This is your seat. This is where you sit. This is where you sit. Maybe one back sometimes but this is where you sit. And if you go to the restaurant, you'll eat the same food. All depends on what restaurant I go to. If I go to Applebee's, I know what I'm gonna have. It's either gonna be uh, oriented chicken, sal chicken salad or it's gonna be the, the, the shrimp with the, with, the, with the chicken breast, whatever that thing's called. And it's gonna be the same thing all the time. I go to the same gas station I go to the same pump. We're a boring bunch of people. 
But I looked at this young man and I sat on the platform and I said, you see those poles that are out there? I said, I, I, I had Woody Noble put A through L all the way across those poles. He said, why? I said, for you. He said, what do you mean? I said, for people just like you because people are creatures of habit. I said, see that last row over there? He said, yeah. I said, inside, not the outside row by the stairs, but the inside row. I said, four rows from the back. I said, first person, her name is Louise Latham. I said, you know who's sitting next to Louise Latham? Naomi Britt. That's where she always sat. I said, you see that guy sitting in the platform, uh, up in the, the, the crow's nest up there we call the sound booth? His name is Ron Troutman. And I went right down, and that's how I train him because we are creatures of habit. When we get out of that habit, what happens is we get out of sync with what God is trying to do. Um, I'm going to move on. I, I, I got a lot more to cover, and I know I've only got about 10 minutes. So I, I could go somewhere else with that, but I'm, please forgive me. Um, if you spend time with the people who are committed, and they're committed to God and His Word, you will become a stronger, committed Christian. Why? Because that's what you talk about. Now, I'm going to be very transparent with my sons that are here tonight. One of the greatest times I had with my sons was when we had men's camp and I brought the trailer up and we sat there that night and we just talked about the Bible. We just talked about the Bible. It was just us three, everybody had gone to bed, cold outside. We were sitting there. We just talked about the Bible. Iron sharpens iron. I didn't say I was shoving it down anybody's throat. Listen to me now. But when God opens the door, you start walking through the door gently. When you make a friend with somebody and all of a sudden you're sitting there talking about the Bible. I've got friends that, they, if you think I know everything about the Bible, you're wrong. I don't. I'm a student of the word. I learn things all the time. And there are times that I picked up the phone and called different individuals and can you explain this scripture to me? I love having people in my life like that, that we can just sit there and share the word of God with. Most people say, well, I'm not gonna do that because it makes me look like I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, sometimes you don't. Um, sometimes I don't. And I would rather be very, very honest and look at you when it comes to the word of God and how I handle the word of God and say, I don't know what that means, but I will tell you this, I will find out what it means. And then I will come back because I value the word of God and say, this is what that scripture is talking about. And here's why. Because I value you and I value the word of God. But I also value the relationships that I have with people who are able to explain that to me. Now, parents, what type of people are you letting your kids hang out with? Hello. I love you, but I love our kids as well. And I'm, I'm teaching us some things right now, talking about 10 habits of highly healthy homes. If you want a healthy home, you better be the watchman on the wall when it comes to your kids. What are you letting them watch? And not everything that you let them watch is conducive. It's not necessarily bad, but it's not conducive for them as a Christian young person. We think allowing them to have certain games and going through certain games is, is an okay thing. Let me tell you what. I respect my son-in-laws and my, my daughters because they put a time limit on, 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 on they call it uh, um, tablet time. Tablet time. Everybody has a tablet, right? Everybody does. Well, it's a mini or one. It makes no difference. Everybody's got one. And my grandkids are no, no different than anybody else's. If you let them, they'll stay on that tablet 24-7. But let me tell you what happens. It's a thing called endorphins that go take off in their brain. And then they don't know, know how to work with their hands. We talked about that for the campus. Most of the kids in the world today don't know how to work with their hands. Why? Because they're on a computer 24-7 and they're playing all kind of games that they shouldn't be playing and moms and dads should be telling them what they can and what they can't be playing. 
or looking at them saying, no, you go outside and you play for a while. Right. Hello. My daughter looked at my, my grandson the other day and said, no, you're done. You go outside and you play. Well, there's nothing to do out there. We'll make something up. Hello? How many of us did that when we were kids? We went outside and we just found something to do. We didn't have all this kind of stuff that we got now. And because of it, what happens, in conversation I have over the campus today, young adults don't know how to work with their hands. They know nothing about building a house. They don't have, forget a house. They don't know nothing about building a birdhouse. They don't know which end the saw is. Because that's not what they're used to. Who are you letting your children hang out with? Now, I'm going to get very real right now. There were times I didn't even let my children hang out with some people that were in the church because I didn't like what I was seeing. I did not. And I looked at my girls and I said, nope, you're not spending the night. It's not happening. Not until I see certain things take place in that family's life. I'm sorry, you're not rubbing heads with my kid. My kid is not better than them. Probably my kid is probably worse than them in certain areas, but that's still my kid. But there are some people that I have, I'm, I said this earlier, I have a lot of acquaintances. And I do. But I don't have a lot of friends. Because some of the people that are even my acquaintances are not wanting to talk about the things that I want to talk about. And that's talking about winning souls. That's talking about people getting the Holy Ghost. Oh, I like going out and having a good time. And thank you, Brother Rash, or, or uh, Brother uh, Paul Fagler as well, for that uh, the men's uh, uh, rafting trip the other day. The water was calm. It was good. I had a great time. <laughs> and I kept my ribs intact. And I had an eight-year-old grandson that was out there that had the time of his life. And he was with a bunch of the men from the church. And afterwards he said, Poppy, I want to do that again. This is very, very practical. I understand that. But I'm looking at families in the church and I'm looking at you saying, I want you to be successful in your home. If you're successful in your home living for God, you'll be successful in the world living for God. But if you're not successful in here, I promise you this, you won't be successful out there. There are some people that I didn't let my girls hang out with. Some kids didn't come to my house. I'm going to be honest with you. Some kids were hellions. I didn't let them through the door. Because I knew that their mothers and fathers didn't, make them cor didn't correct them. And you're not going to come into my house like a whirlwind and break everything that I have worked so hard to get. Hello? I know it's not about things. Listen to me. But that's because it's not about things doesn't give you the right to come in and destroy somebody's home. Hallelujah, glory to God. Let me also say this, moms and dads, how much time do you spend with your kids? Not only who you allow your kids to hang out with, how much time do you spend with them? How much time do you influence your kids? When my grandson was very small, my son-in-law Aaron didn't even think his son liked him. He wanted to have anything to do with him, it seemed like for the first two years. He would come in, oh, it's the truth. He would come in and he wanted a puppy. And so Aaron didn't think Levi even liked him. That made Poppy feel good. Didn't make Dad feel too good. <laughs> he'd come in the house and he'd go past everybody else and come straight to Poppy. And I had to look at my son-in-law and said, there's going to come a day when he's not going to like Poppy near as much as he likes you. And that day has arrived. And he likes hanging out with his dad. But I will tell you this. I'm very, very careful 
who I associate myself with because I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not. You invite me over. We want to go have a bite to eat. Not a problem at all. But I'm very, very careful. And you need to be careful too. Now, Jesus, he dealt with sinners and publicans. He ate with them. He did a lot with them. Why? Because he was trying to teach a bunch of self-righteous people how to deal with people that were not in the church. That's what he was trying to do. He was trying to deal with Pharisees who were self-righteous is what he's trying to do. So he ate with publicans, he ate with sinners, and they, got, and they, 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 they called him on it. And basically he was saying, well, if we don't go after them, who's going to go after them? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what do you give most of your time to? What do you give most of your leisure time to? What are you watching on the, I'm going to put it, on the tube? What are you allowing to go into your ear gate? Because things that go into your ear gate or your eye gate, I'm going to tell you this right now, you're going to remember that a long time. And I said it already, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And if you're doing that, are you spending just as much time in the Word and in prayer as you are in that? Hallelujah. Because if we're not, we are robbing God. We're robbing God. Proverbs 13 and 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Who are you going to hang out with, wise people or a companion of fools? Two more, and I'm going to get done with this. I know it's 831. The S is your schedule. The S, the first, is your schedule. Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. How do I put God first in my schedule? I ask God to help me to use my time wisely. I don't know about you, but I make a to-do list. I make a to-do list. I have it right here. It's in my notes. And this is what I got to get, get done today. I don't go about my day haphazard. I do everything by schedule. I live in my truck. Anybody who knows me knows that. I live, <laughs> the campus is shaking his head. You call me, most of the time, I'm in my truck um, from one place to another or one hospital to another. That's what I, that's what I do. So if you want counsel, it's probably going to be over top the speakers in my truck. Don't worry, it's just me and God in there. And that's where I'm at. And there are times I can, someone says, can you have coffee today? No, I can't, I'm sorry. Why? Because my day is already lined up. My day is lined up before that day ever begins. I start lining it up the night before because I know what I've got to do. So I make this list so I can be more effective for God in, this, in, in my life. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Now, let me just talk about this for a moment. That's how I start my day. I know it's not easy. Trust me. I don't like getting up at 5.30 in the morning. I don't. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I get up at 5.45. And Sister Bishop is saying, are you going to prayer? And in my flesh, I'm saying, no. I'm being honest. No. I like this bed. And this pillow fits my head just right. But I know that if I don't, I'm going to be kicking myself. And how can I lead a church if I don't partake of first fruits myself? Now, there's a lot of times Brother Dan and Sister Grace have a key to this building and they open this building up every morning at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. They're usually the first people here. And publicly, I just want to say thank you. I thank you. Because you open the building and you close the building 
And that's important because a church that does not know how to pray will not be a revival church. A church that does not know how to pray will not have power with God. You'll, you may sing, you may play, you may do a lot of things right, but you will not be life impacting because only a church that knows how to pray is going to be life impacting. And so I start my day right here. And there's a place that I like to pray. It's not out here. When I'm by myself, it's usually right here. But where I like to pray, Kylan, is where you're at right now. And every morning, I sit back there in the media booth and I talk to God. Doesn't make me more special than anybody else. I'm just telling you that God, if I want God to be first, God's got to be first in my schedule as well. Now, I know it's not conducive for everyone to come here. I get that. But we open the church for those who want to start their day and they're on their way to work from their homes. They stop by for a few minutes. Then they, then they shoot on over to work. That's why we did it, because we wanted them to start their day right. But I know that it's not very conducive for everybody to probably come here because we're coming from different places. You're coming from Manteca, and some coming from Stockton, some coming from different areas. I, I get that. The point I'm making is this. If you want God first in your schedule, then put God first in your schedule by praying. That's the point I'm making. The T in first. Found in the book of Psalms chapter 50 and verse 15. Come on, Sister Bracken, if you don't mind, please. The Bible says in Psalms 50 and 15, and call upon me in the day of trouble. Everyone say trouble. Trouble. Everyone say trouble. Trouble. And I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. How come it is that we glorify God when he answers prayer, but he, we don't glorify God before then? There's a song that we used to sing a long time ago that says, don't wait till the battle's over, shout now. Don't wait till the battle's over, shout now. If you look in the Old Testament, God looked at them and said, I want you to walk around Jericho, and this is what I want you to do. And they did it. He said, now I want you to walk around it seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you to shout. The walls were still up when they shouted, folks. Hear me. The walls were still up when they started shouting. The trouble was still there when they started shouting. And the Lord spoke to them and said, I want you to shout on the seventh time you go around. And it was only in a step of faith that they started shouting that the walls came down. We don't usually shout until God brings the victory. God is saying, I want you to shout before the victory. Why? Because Psalms 50 and 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Amen. He's not saying wait until the battle's over. He's saying, shout now. Amen. God says, turn to me first when you've got a problem. We turn to everybody else, but we don't turn to God. Prayer should be the first option, not the, not the last resort. God is waiting to hear from us. Put me first, even in tough times, is what God is saying. Don't wait till it's over. Put me first now. Why is it that we get God involved in it down the road, but we don't get God involved in it in the middle? Or God involved, or excuse me, in the, in the beginning? I was talking to someone the other day and I said, you know what, if I had that kind of a problem and I had that kind of a diagnosis, I'm going to tell you right now, I'd be in church every time the doors were opened, every time. Doctor looked at me and gave me that type of a diagnosis. I can tell you this, I would never miss church. Because staying at home is not going to be the answer for my life. Sitting there having a pity party is not going to be the answer in my life. Woe is me is not going to be the answer in my life. My father was 55 years old. I'll never forget it. He was 55 years old, and I watched him lose, losing weight. And I didn't know what was going on. And finally, I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad, what is wrong with you? He said, well, son, I went to the ur urologist, and I've got prostate cancer. 
and it's not good. And I was the only one who knew it outside of my stepmother. I had a revival with a man by the name of Charles Pierce. I don't know if some of you remember that revival. I remember it very well. And uh, he was from Mississippi. And um, God used him in the gifts of the Spirit. When he was done preaching, he preached on faith. And when he was done preaching, my father always sat where he always sat, which was the middle aisle, about three rows from the back, next to the pole. Okay, some of you are smiling because you know where that's at. And I'm talking, they sat in the same spot all the time. And that's where dad sat. And this preacher went back to where my father was. And he looked at my dad and he said, you've been given a bad report by the doctor. This man never knew my dad and my dad never saw this man. It was just God working through this man. He said, you've been given a bad report by the doctor. He said, I'm telling you right now. He said, God is healing you. Don't worry about it. He said, you're going to be just fine. He laid his hand on my dad's head, prayed a simple prayer, didn't shake his head off, prayed a simple prayer, turned around and walked about and started praying for somebody else. My father had an appointment with the urologist. Urologist said, we don't understand what's going on. You had prostate cancer. You have no prostate cancer. Within two weeks, my dad's weight started coming back. He started getting more flushed in the face started getting life in him again and he died when he was 91 years old and that was five or six years ago now there was a man that was sitting right here in a wheelchair his name is Dan his wife brought him her name is Danielle they've been in the church here on a couple of different occasions I got a phone call one day and it was from Sister Dawn uh, Cavender she said pastor would you and Sister Bishop please go by and pray for my friend doctors have given up hope on him they called in hospice and it's just going to be a matter of time. I said, yes. So we go, it's in Stockton on Geary Street over off of California. We walk in. He's lying. They got a hospital bed in the, in the living room. He's lying in the hospital bed. I sit there and I listen. We were there for probably an hour, hour and a half. And all I did was just listen. Time to, time to leave. I reached down and grabbed him by the hand. And when I reached down and grabbed him by the hand, God told me to tell him something. I said, you're not going to die. I don't care what the doctor said. You're not going to die. You're going to live. And all of a sudden, a peace came into that room. And I was on one side of him, kneeling down. His wife and Sister Bishop were on the other side. Tears were running down his face. What he didn't know is while he was just laying there in the hospital bed with a death sentence, he was ministering to me. He was. I never met this man in my life. But he just started ministering to me. Now, he hadn't been to a barber in a long time. And his hair was down to here. He was lying in this room, or hospital bed, in the living room. And the doctors gave up hope, said, call hospice. Because there's nothing more we can do. And about three weeks ago, he sat right about there. And last Sunday, we moved this chair out of the way, and he sat right here. And I walked by him, and I knelt down in front of him. I said, Brother Dan, I said, you look so good. I said, you're gaining weight. I said, and the life is coming back. He said, my cheeks are getting rosy again, aren't they, Pastor? I said, yeah, Brother Dan, they're getting rosy again. What am I saying? You call on God in the midst of your trouble. It's not, oh, me. It's, Oh God, only you can do this. Only you can do this. Read in the book of Daniel. Three Hebrew boys are in, in, in the fiery furnace. They didn't owe me. Oh my. They just said, you know what? God is able. And if he doesn't, oh well, we're still going to trust him. That's where you have to be. God is not absence of the troubles in your life. God wants to be involved in the middle of the troubles of your life. And if you don't get him involved, he's not going to run you over because God is a gentleman. He said, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, I stand at the door and I knock. And I wait for somebody to open the door so that I can come in. I don't know about you, but I want to be one of the ones that have a highly healthy home. That when people, as we stand tonight, that when people walk into Brother and Sister Bishop's home, they can feel the peace of God. I've had this happen. 
I've had people walk into my home and they just looked at me and said, what is different about your home? I said, nothing's different about my home. It's just a home. Nothing's expensive. It's just my home. They said, no, there's something different about your home. What's different? I said, you tell me. They said, it's so peaceful here. My granddaughter, she made us laugh the other day. She said, we had kids had not been over to our house for a while, the grandkids. And she said um, to her mother, Shannon, she said, I miss Mima. She said, why? She said, because Mima's fancy. And she said, I like going to her home because it's peaceful. It's peaceful. I've asked God to live in my home. I've asked God to be in my home. So that when people walk through the doors, everything that I may or may not have doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. But more than anything else, those are things that will just burn. When people walk in my home, I want them to know that the peace speaker lives in my home. That I can sit there and God just moves in. Hello? God is not absence of your troubles. God wants to be in the midst of your troubles. And then I can turn them over to God and say, okay, God, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to deal with this. It belongs to you. Maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, boy, pastor, that habit, number one, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> no, it's not. And it's not easy for any of us. But maybe I've learned a few things in life of living for God that it took me a little bit more time than maybe somebody else to learn. And so the first that we talked about was, God, I want you to be first in my finances. And I'll, be, I'll, I'll take care of my responsibility. God, I want you to be first in my interests, the things that interest me as a person. God, I want you to be first in my relationships. I want you to be first in my schedule, God. And God, I have to have you first in my troubles. Because if you're first in all of that, then I've laid the foundation that needs to be laid. And you are my God and there's no other God before me you are the only thing that I need and so tonight I know I've kept you a little bit longer than what I normally do I do apologize but I'm going to ask you to step out from where you're standing and let's end this service today tonight around the altar can we do that for a little bit tonight just let's come down with your family and let's talk to the Lord for a few moments tonight